privilege to, inter to, to introduce tonight's speaker. Uh, this is your guys' first night hearing Tyrone speak, which she calls on. Tyrone is passionate. He is empowered by the Holy Spirit. And I, uh, I love watching this guy, man. When you spend five minutes with Tyrone, you feel love. This is a man that's genuine to his core, and it shows in the, just, just in his smile alone. I've, uh, I've really I've been blessed to get to know this guy a little bit over the past several years. And, you know, you know, every year we get uh, requests, you know, for, for guys to come back and speak. There's a reason why Tyrone has spoken at every every time we've been up here. And that's because you guys keep asking for him. He's uh, actually the only speaker we have speaking this year at two sites. Again, because nobody did enough of this guy. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm making you live up to something right now, brother. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm never going to forget. This was a, a joke that really went over like a lead balloon. But Dave Browning, a couple years ago, introduced Tyrone. And uh, and I'm gonna mess it up now, but uh, he was talking about the, uh, the three going into the fiery furnace and talking about how Tyrone referred to them as. Uh, you want to say it? So I don't have to. Shadrach, one bad Negro. One bad Negro. I I I still laugh every day, man. They've gone for that. But you guys, uh, I, I hope you're ready, uh, Tyrone. That's a lot of pressure. That's a lot of pressure. Well, I'm here because, you know, I love you brothers and I want to help and, and be encouraged and encourage you. And the message I'm about to speak is it's something I would love to just go all over the world speaking. Uh, something the Lord put in my heart. Years ago when I read this book, and I thought to myself that, man, this is how I want to live my life. And I think that a lot of us have been really, really encouraged, you know, these last weeks on the messages, you know, where the rubber meets the road, amen? And also, I hope that you've taken the opportunity to check yourself. Look at someone and say, check yourself. Come on, amen. we got to sometimes check ourselves, amen? And it's good to be challenged. Amen? It's going to be challenged. It's going to be stirred. You know, it's good. I, I always be, remind myself that sometimes when we get those messages that really deal with us, make us uncomfortable, you know, so that we don't just kind of sit in the view and view. Amen? And so um, I, I kind of, this is what I kind of think about, is about pulling ourselves together. We get to that little video. This is how we sometimes can have a good reaction like this in church sometimes. I don't know if they got that video up. Okay, if you remember anything from this sermon, that's what you're going to remember, amen? Sometimes we need that, amen, just to kind of pull ourselves together, somebody hit us, swat us around. I call it pimp slapping, amen. Sometimes we can get a good pimp slap, amen. And so it, this is it's so important in our lives. Now, let me kind of just start with this, is that what is to our, what we think about evangelism? What is evangelism? And sometimes a lot of times we might just think that it's just preaching the word of God and people kind of maybe saying a prayer and that's great. But evangelism is not just that. Evangelism is retention. Evangelism is reproduction. And a lot of times we might think, well, okay, they said a prayer, they put their name on a little card, and we kind of put them right into a program. Or, you know, just think about this, the reality, they say a prayer and then we never see them again. See, that's not what evangelism is. Evangelism is a process. Evangelism is a long process in our life so, so, so we can grow to become, the, where we can begin to um, reproduce after ourselves. So there's a lot of plans for evangelism. There's a lot of methods for evangelism. But I want to talk about a master plan of evangelism. You guys all heard some great sermons, but tonight I want to just do something that, that will help us to apply something. Because if we don't apply something, we are going to die. Are you guys with me here? It's something like you've got to, you've got to understand something here. That we, if we do not reproduce after ourselves, 
What's going to begin to happen is that we're going to die. We're going to become extinct. Are you guys with me here? So I, I want to just, you know, make sure that nobody here is taking any spiritual birth control. Amen? I want to make sure that, you know, we're ready to produce that, you know, we, we still got what it takes and we're not shooting spiritual blanks. Come on now. Are you with me here? All right. Some of you got that one. We're going to open up in the, in the scripture, 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 12 through 14. As we look at this, I want, I want you to see some stages of maturity. The Bible re it reads like this, I write to you little children because your sins are forgiven uh, you for, your, for his name's sake. I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you young men because you have overcome the wicked one. And I write to you little children because you have known the father. Verse 14, I have written to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I have written to you young men because you are strong and the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the wicked one. Amen. Amen. How many have overcome the wicked one? Amen. Come on. Amen. Think about this. Now, this shows us several types of maturity mentioned here in John. There's little children, there's young men, and there's fathers. We need little children. I'm talking about spiritual maturity. We need new converts. Can you say amen? I mean, new converts, I mean, that's the life of the church. Amen? I mean, that's important. If we don't have new converts, then again, who's, we're not having any babies. We have to have some young men that are teachable, and we have to have some fathers. Amen? We have to have some fathers in the faith. So I want to talk about a, a kind of a method, master plan of evangelism that Jesus used in the scriptures. How did he bring these ragtag men, these men that were tax collectors, men that were losers, men that didn't make much of, of their lives, to a place where they won the world, to a place where we have the gospel today? Think about these guys, uneducated. Come on now, you know what I'm saying? I mean, these men that were just normal, mere human beings and to bring the gospel to what we have today. Think about that, amen. So we're gonna look at something. The first thing I wanna look at is selection. Selection, you can write this down. Uh, men were his method. The scripture I wanna use in this is Luke chapter six, verse 13. And when it was day, he called his disciples to himself. And when he chose the, the twelve, whom he also named as apostles. Very clear something here. Jesus prayed all night. The Bible says that in the scriptures before that, he prayed all night and he handpicked the disciples. Think about this. The ones that he approached and he came up to them and he said, follow me. He prayed for those. He saw them in his prayer time. And he began to look for them. And when he connected, he said, follow me. Now, these guys were not in a trance. They were not in a trance like, okay, they dropped their nets and they followed them. You know, I followed them. It wasn't something like that at all. It was that, man, this rabbi of rabbi is calling me out. He selected him. Think about this. He selected him. He took Time to pray and to seek the face of the Father. What men would you have me to begin to work with? It wasn't just any kind of men. So the gospel would not be here today if these men failed. It all rolled upon these men. Think about this. It wasn't on angels. It was on men. You and I, mere mortal men. And selection must happen for anything to happen. The disciples had no idea. They were just fishing. They were just doing their thing. And here we see in the scripture that Jesus shows up and he says, come and follow me. And he eradicated their lives. Changed everything. Isn't that what happened when Jesus came into your life? He eradicated all your dreams and all your ambitions. Everything got eradicated because no longer you're serving yourself. Now you're serving him. Amen. I, I guess that's what's supposed to happen. Come on now, amen. So selection has to happen. Listen to you guys, if we don't have selection, if we don't begin to select men in our churches, select men in our surroundings, you know what these men, their destiny, they'll never be fulfilled. Think about this, this is something that we have to apply. There's men in your church that are just sitting there. They don't even know what to do. They've been to this class or that class. They come to church once in a while, sitting right next to you. These are men that you can pray to God. Who do you have men to begin to work with? Selection. Come on, somebody say selection. Selection, selection is the process of a spiritual destiny. And these men had no idea. They had no idea they were going to be called to change the world. They had no idea. And they had no skills. 
Aren't you glad that you were selected by Christ? Amen. Now it's our turn to start to select men. This is applicable. Number two, I want to show you something about selection. The next thing the Bible says, it talks about association. Jesus stayed with them. He hung out with them. Jesus wasn't like kind of some guy who shows up with an entourage. You know what I'm saying? No, he was untouchable. No, he was among the men. And the Bible talks about when he selected these men that they, they asked, where do you sleep? Where do you go? He goes, come and see. He opened up his life. Think about this. Jesus opened up his life. After selection, you have to be willing to sacrifice time out of your life to associate with those that you've selected. Not just on a Sunday so they can see the back of your head. Come on now. Or just kind of like a little quick handshake. It's so superficial. It's so shallow. But some time out of the week, you get with that, those men or that God that you were, that you've selected. And you begin to associate. Amen. You begin to work with that God. See, this is, this is so important because you cannot raise men without association. You've got to be in their lives. You've got to allow a chunk out of your life and begin to impart and begin to work with these men to have an association. You know this, fathers, as little children. You, if you have little children, you know this, that, that you need to be around in the most formidable state of our children when they're kids. Because if not, association determines what kind of people they will become. They'll either become bitter or they'll become better. Amen. Because of our association with them. And you know, we can, we can look and blame the devil and blame the world and blame all that stuff. But the quality of Christianity we have today falls on us. Were we there when they were little children? Were we there when they were spiritually immature? Were we there to impart and to work and to associate and to impact their lives? Or we just kind of, kind of let them grow? We don't do that naturally. Why would we do that spiritually? Somebody help me. Come on now. Are you guys with me? Selection. And then we got to associate with them. This is what becomes in my life. They begin to work with me and associate with me. I wasn't like kind of just kind of, well, you just kind of go through the process. No, he was in my life. Brother Matty was in my life. He picked me up from church. He made sure I was there. He associated with my life. He went, I, I went to his house. He went to my house. Hello. Now I'm getting uncomfortable. Now I'm talking like I'm from a cult. I mean, today you go to church, ask the brother, hey, man, I'm going for lunch. Why? What do I do? Why? Come on. What are you trying to sell me? Nothing, man. Hello. Number three. After selection, association, you're with that brother, then comes consecration. Oh, I love this one. Jesus required obedience. Oh, I know we don't like that word. Don't tell me what to do. Come on, are you with me here? Yes. See, the Bible says in Matthew 11, 29, he says, he says, my yoke, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and I will find, and you will find rest for your soul. Jesus, his yoke was his teaching. He required that, 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 that he required obedience to his word. You see, this is what happens when, uh, when, when we allow God to become charge of our lives. Every believer has to eventually make this decision. Am I going to be a doer of God's word, or am I just going to be a looker? There comes a time you get saved, you, you commit in a sense to Jesus, you accept them, but then there comes a time when you've got to say, I'm all in. That's right. I'm all in. You know, we say in L.A., you know, I'm from L.A., so we say, hey, homies, I'm in it till the wheels fall off. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And sometimes we've got to do that. Sometimes we've got to make a consecrated decision. Listen to this. This is so, so important. Through association, we can encourage change and actually see where men are really are, where they really are in their faith. At church, like I said, it's so superficial. How you doing? Good, brother. How you? But when you get to their home, you begin to realize what kind of believer are they really? I mean, I didn't try to judge anybody, but you selected them, you're associating with them, and you're trying to bring that brother to a place of consecration where Jesus is Lord. Where Jesus is all in all. 
But when you associate, and, and through association, this, this consecration begins to develop, hopefully. And you begin, you go to his house, and, and you, know, you go to his man cave. Oh, come on into my man cave. Come on, don't act like you don't have one. Come into my man cave of carnality. Yeah, I know I've got new pictures. You can't touch them. Just look. Hello. Got bombs everywhere. You know? But I've been going to church. I've been sing singing the songs. I've been going through the motions. But through association, brother, you're helping this guy come to a place where he begins to say, well, you know what? Hey, this is not right. I didn't know what was wrong. I didn't know what was right. I wasn't raised in church, but because of association, this one brother began to bring me to a place of consecration. Always challenging me in my heart. Are you in? Are you in? Then get rid of this. I remember getting rid of all my Led Zeppelin albums. Come on, they're on ACDC and all that. I even took my brother's stuff. <laughs> he got pretty t He's still ticked off today after 35 years. Amen. But I remember so many times, and, and, and you know, just how he challenged me through consecration. Come on, brother, give it up. Let's be real. And this happens when you and I are personally in people's lives. Are you guys with me here? Yeah. In association, you see if they're teachable. You see if they're willing to make changes. You see if they're sold out. See, folks, because if they can't pass that, then move on. There's a lot of other men that would love your association, your willingness to help them. So what do we do in this association? What do we do in this consecration? And you feel, that, okay, this guy's teachable. This guy wants to learn. This guy wants to go for it. What do you do? The next one is impartation. Impartation. The Bible says that Jesus gave himself away. Jesus gave himself away. Listen to this in John 20, verse 22. And when he had said this, he says to the disciples, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. When you impart into other men, you are speaking life. You are not just kind of just kind of going through the motions. No, you are speaking spiritual life. The very Holy Spirit that is in your life, you are imparting into them. You are imparting words of spirit and life. That's what Jesus said. When you speak my words, you are, you are speaking spirit and they are life. I'll tell you, there's been times I've sat with brothers that I've been working with and imparting, and I feel the Holy Spirit just flowing through me, and I begin to speak into their lives. There's an impartation, giving them wisdom, understanding, helping them with the scriptures. There's a, there's a giving of, of yourself. But you can't do that if you didn't select and you didn't associate. Are you guys with me here? I've had some phenomenal times. With brothers who are being be able to, if it just meant going on a little short-term mission, or maybe just hanging out, a little barbecue after church, and just, just hanging out with some brothers and just speaking into their lives. You know, it's an amazing thing. I mean, even just last Sunday, we had one of our guys uh, speak who I've known for over 20 years, and, and he's still hanging on some words that I spoke to him about. But it wasn't words of Tyrone. It was the words of the Holy Spirit that at that moment in his life that he needed, and the Holy Spirit moved on my heart, and I imparted it to him, and he's lived on that. This is what we do. This is what we give. Come on. And it's very difficult to get something if we don't have it. Hello. Come on, you got the Holy Spirit? I got a couple of you saying, come on, you got the Holy Spirit? Come on. You can't be saved without the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit moving in your life. Oh man, sometimes, you know, I know that I'm getting with some brothers. Well, you know, I'll get charged up. I'll start getting prayed up because I want to give them something. I want, I want to encourage them. I had brothers come to me at, when I was growing in the Lord and working with some guys uh, at, at after church. They went, hey, bro, you have a scripture for us? You got, and then for about 15 minutes, just imparting into their lives. Amazing time. Impartation. Jesus gave himself away. You see, listen to this. No consecration on that guy. The guy's like, yeah, hey, you know, can just going through the motions? Listen to me, there's going to be no impartation. Why would you impart something so beautiful, the Holy Spirit in life, into somebody who's not going to do nothing with it? Why would we give pearls to swine? Jesus said. It's not 
an, impart, an impartation of physical things, but our spiritual life imparting into another brother. The dimension of the Holy Spirit working in you into another brother. I mean, even, I mean, there was a time where Jesus in John chapter 20, verse 23 and 24, you can write that down. John 20, uh, verses 23 and 24, the Bible says that there were some people that believed on him. They believed on miracles were happening. And everybody's got to get all excited. But the Bible says that Jesus, Jesus did not commit himself to them. I mean, these are people that believe. These are people who are excited about what's going on. And the Bible says that Jesus basically, in a paraphrased way of saying it, he said, eh, no thanks. And he walked away from revival. He walked away from a bunch of people that were believing. Why? And the Bible says, because Jesus knew the hearts of men. He says, you know, they're just going to be excited. We call them Kellogg Christians. Snap, crackle, pop. Hello. Come on, you're with me here. What good is it? Jesus said. Listen to me. Jesus actually said no. He said no. They want, hey, you're supposed to be a loving God. You're supposed to serve me. You're supposed to bless me, God. And Jesus said, Nah, I don't think so. I'm gonna move on. And he moved on. And that hit me to the core. Because Paul says this, these words, he says that the grace of God in me was not in vain. Jesus, what you did in me was not in vain. And I began to think that if Jesus would walk away from these people because he knew their hearts that they were just kind of in for it for the flop. Am I in it for the flop, God? Amen. I mean, did Jesus save you for nothing? I mean, raise your hand if you feel that like Jesus just saved you for nothing. Well, no hands went up. Then prove it. Prove it. Make sure that whatever's been imparted into you is going to get into somebody else. Because no one, why, why should he even give it to you? No revelation lately? You know why? Because there's no outflow. There ain't no outflow, there's no, in, there's no inflow, there's no outflow. Oh, come on, help us. I'm just trying to give you something to apply in your life. Right. Folks, this is what we got to do, man. We got to do this. It's impartation. I don't know if you want me back next year. <laughs> but that's all right. I want to, I mean, I could say this. If I, if I had one thing to say, this is what I would say. You know, impart into other people's lives. Amen. You know, so that way we, we're, we're not taking this, 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 what God has put in us as waste. And this is where young men come in. If you're in that place of young men maturity, this is where I'm, where I'm talking to young men. What are you going to do with your spiritual life? Are you going to make something of yourself? You know the speech. We say that to our young men. Come on. Get things set. And that sometimes we got to do that in impartation. What are you going to do? Are you going to go on, or is it going to be the same old, same old? You're just so disgusted and busted with your faith. Amen? The next one we go, after impartation, we go to another one called, it's called demonstration. Demonstration. Now, you selected the guy. You spent time with the guy. You feel that he's consecrated his life to where it's Jesus. Now he's worthy of your impartation. Did I say that right? He's worthy. I don't waste my time with people. Come on now. If you're not in, see you later. I'll move on to this. There's a whole bunch of other guys that need impartation and want it. Come on now. Don't look at me all holy. <laughs> then after impartation, this guy's on the move. He's receiving what, what I'm speaking into his life. He's being obedient to the scriptures. The next thing you know, we go into demonstration. Jesus showed them how to live. Here's where the rubber meets the road, guys. I'm sorry. People are looking at you. People are watching your life. I wish they would, and it'd be a lot easier. Come on now. John 13, 15 in our scripture up here, it says, For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. We, we respond. They need to see how we respond in our life. You're driving with the brother because of association. You're in the same car. Somebody cuts you off. What are you going to do? You're going to flag him down with the, and let him know he's number one? Come on now. 
Are you going to get all frustrated? Somebody's going to come against you. They watch how you respond in life. How do you respond to your children? How do you respond to your wife? Can they see your faith? Then can you demonstrate your life and your commitment to your local church? Because now you've been pardoned. Now you've got them hooked. And now they want to become, in a sense, like you. They want to be like you. So now you've demonstrated your life. Listen to this, you guys. Men want to be like you. Oh, I'm just, just pointing them to Jesus. Let everybody just follow the moonbeam. If that was the case, then we'd still be following the moonbeam. But men were his method. Men like you and I. Where Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. He's saying, imitate me as I imitate Christ. This is a demonstration. Listen, this is where fathers kick in. We went from little children. We, do, we covered up young men. Now let's look at fathers. You see, you, what, what kind of father do you want to be in the faith? Do as I say, not as I do. Or are you going to be, watch my life, and I'm going to demonstrate to you how to live for God. I'm going to show you how to pray. I'm going to show you how to respond. I'm going to show you how to witness. I'm going to show you how to preach the word of God. I'm going to, I'm going to do everything I can to help you. See, because, because this is the kind of fathers that God is looking for. That men that can say, you know what? I'm here to encourage you to do as Christ and look at my life as a model. Hello? I don't like the pressure, but that's how it is. Paul said to Timothy many times, he calls him my son, my son. He wasn't his biological father, but he was his spiritual father. And he said, Timothy, my son. You see, folks, we need fathers in the body of Christ. Can you say amen? amen. Come on, we need some fathers, amen. And fathers have sons in the faith. And Paul said it many times. He says, teach other men what, uh, what to do as you have seen me do, he says. And I'm sure anybody here would rather see a sermon than hear one any day. Yes, <coughs> Amen? So we have demonstration. You show us how to live. People are looking at your life. They're watching you. How do you worship? Hello? How do you, you sing? Just like your own kids watch you. Come on, this is good pressure. Amen? It's a good pressure. There are times I didn't want to go to church, but I said, you know what? i got to go to church. i got to get to church because some brothers are depending on me. I'm going to show up even though I don't want to, but I'm going to show up because these guys are going to look for me and they want to they sit around me. And, and, and you know, So there's a beautiful pressure. And you don't have to be a pastor to do that. The one who decided to be wasn't a pastor. And he worked with me. So after this demonstration, and now they're starting to see your life, here comes a good one. It's called delegation. Now after demonstration, you begin to delegate. The Bible says that Jesus assigned them work. Matthew 4.19 says, then he said to them, follow me and listen to this. I will make you, I will make you do it. I will make you fishers of men. It wasn't like, follow me, like, kind of like a suggestion, if you kind of feel led to do it. No, no, no. You want to follow me, I'm going to make you fishers. <laughs> if you're going to follow Jesus, here's rule number one. He will have you do what you don't want to do. I think his name is Jonah. And since when this, this, this easy-coded Christianity that it, it's not God's will because it's hard. It's not God's will because it doesn't make me happy. Amen. No, God's going to call you to do something you don't want to do. So he gets the glory. And then pretty soon in the middle of it, you're going to go, man, I'm loving this. Because it's no longer I, it's doing but he in me. So delegation, he assigned some work, not a suggestion. Listen to this. Do we have any men, in, 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 men who consider themselves uh, consider themselves soldiers for Christ? Any soldiers in the house? Come on. Okay, and you know this word. It's called deployment. You don't sign up and say, "Well, I want to do this." Give me the big guns. I had you a mop. I deploy you to you know swap the deck. <laughs> Come on now. 
Amen. No, no, no. Deployment, we're going to tell you what to do. Because that's important. Because, and you know, you're willing to be told what to do. Are you with me here? You're willing to be, to, to be told what to do. Because you've gone through consecration. You've gone through impartation. You've gone through demonstration. Now you want to do something. And now, and, and, and through this, you, you become active. And when you become active, you stimulate and exercise the spiritual giftings that are in your life. I mean, if I, if I just demonstrate to guys and don't get them delegated again and deploy them or something, their gifts are never going to come out. They're just going to sit there. But now we've got to activate them. We've got to stimulate them. We've got to encourage them. We've got to encourage them to do things that they can't do so they can trust Christ. I love it when we have some people speak in our church that are in our body and they say, Pastor, I am so nervous. I said, I go, You know, I'm just so nervous. I say, good, that's a good nervous. Just be nervous when you're not nervous. Because <laughs> you're depending on God. Delegation. Delegation. You're going to say words like this. Come on. Come on, man. We're going to do this. We are intentional in our delegation of tasks. So there's so many men in your churches today that need deployment. But we need to go through those steps. Amen. After demonstration, delegation. Stay with me here. I've got a couple more. Last, one, uh, last two. Next one is supervision. Supervision. This is where we mess up a lot. As fathers, the Bible says that he checked on them. Look at Mark 8, 17 of our scripture. Mark 8, 17, Jesus being aware of it. This is after and he's about to do a miracle. Everybody's complaining, tripping out. He's with the disciples, and Jesus being aware of it said to them, Why do you reason because you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive nor understand? Is your heart still hardened? And then he reminds them of the other scriptures. Don't you remember I fed the 5,000? I multiplied the fish and the, and the bread. Don't you remember? He goes, is your head, heart not still hardened? He's supervising. Come on, guys. Stay focused. Come on. I've been it before. I can do it again. Come on. Come on. Sit back. Sit back. Hello. Sometimes we can't take correction. We don't want this correction. We don't want this adjustment. We can't just delegate. Okay, no, you delegate and make sure they do it with excellence. Make sure they're prayed up. There's a lot of people that just kind of jump up and do ministry only by the power of their personality. We need to make sure they're prayed up and doing it in the power of the Spirit. Isn't it awesome that we can actually do something for God that we could not do in the world? Amen. Come on now, Amen. And here we see supervision. Jesus uh, brought some adjustment, brought some correction to them, and they were willing to be teachable. You see, because listen to me, and I'm going to say it's not a bad word. You cannot tell a bastard what to do. Because you're fatherless. But the sons of the faith, the sons of the house, they who understand their sons and they understand the quarry, you can speak into the life and you can bring correction so they can become excellent and they can grow and, and do the things that God has called them to do. I mean, I thank God for the rebuke. You ever heard that word before? I've been rebuked. I've been corrected. Not publicly humiliated. No. I'm talking about set aside and grow. That was, uh, let me say it this way. That sucked. <laughs> I'm leaving the church. They don't love here. Where's the union member? I want to talk to the union. Sorry, no union in the house of God. Sometimes we need supervision. Sometimes we need a little rattle. Shake, rattle, and roll. Amen? Amen. Nothing wrong with that. You see, what happens in our lives, we give an honest evaluation of the progress in ministry in life. And I thank God for the people in my life that still supervise me. <coughs> Amen. I've been a pastor for over 20 years, 27 years, and I still have supervisors in my life that speak into my life. And sometimes I, it's not what I want to hear. Amen. And eventually, as you bring these men through the process, and they become sons in the house, you begin to deploy and delegate, and you begin to supervise over them. And then it comes this, this beautiful thing that begins to happen. 
Because I just want you to understand, it does not matter how long. It's, let me take this way. The men that you impact, the men that you select, will always be part of your lives for the rest of your life. I've been all over the world, all over the world that I've connected with and that I've come through this process and we're connected. It's an amazing thing to get, get you know, just encouragement and maybe just kind of get some interaction from, from all over the world. Some, some men that, that, that I've discipled and worked with. It's an amazing thing. You're going to always be, this, you always have this connection is what I'm saying. You're not just going to love them and leave them. And they might go off and be cut on a mighty evangelist. They might go off and start multiple churches. But they'll always consider you their father. <laughs> no, no. Amen. And they're still teachable. Amen. Because they know you've imparted into their lives. So then we get to the next one and the last one. Wow. Did I go over? Oh, I'm good. Last one. Here it goes. Reproduction. He expected them to reproduce. Did you know that? When you got saved, that was God's design. He didn't save us for nothing. He saved us so that way we would reproduce. He had an agenda. He didn't save you to pay your bills, to make your life comfortable, to get you off of drugs. No, 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 he saved you so that way the full intention that you would reproduce after yourself. John 15, 16. Here it is. Jesus says, you did not choose me. That breaks everything. Right? That's a whole other sermon. He said, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. See, here is the master plan that you've been selected and you will begin to select others. Now, how many here have been saved for three years? Raise your hand. Anybody here has been three years? And you probably pretty much go to church every Sunday, right? That was a good news. Depends on your wife if she shows up, right? I'm just kidding. Okay, yeah, so you guys, you guys go to church, right? So that means that for three years, saved for three years, that means you've heard 156 sermons. Some might be duplicated. 156 sermons. I hope it wasn't a waste. Did you get something out of it? Oh, yeah. yeah, pancakes. <laughs> so come on now. <laughs> that too, amen, in our church. Ooh. Amen. We put you in a collar, man. And we just brainwash you. You know what I mean? I put the syrup, John 316. Yeah, that's all. I mean, anyway, we can get it into you. So here's the master plan. Those that have been select, selected will begin to select others. Your life imparting such kingdom responsibility that no matter when, when that happens, when you imparted that into somebody and they received it because of consecration and they made that decision, you have created a monster. No matter what you say from that day forward, they're going to go forward. You might even fail. You might even quit. You might even just jump out of church, but they're going to keep on going because their trust is not in you. You've already put life into them. They're ready to go forward, and they will always, they will always go forward in that manner because you put kingdom responsibility into their hearts. Amen? Amen. This is the best thing we can do for the kingdom of God. So let me just for a moment as we close here. You're mature, been in church for a long time, and you're desiring to be a father, or maybe you consider yourself a spiritual father. I want you to stand for a moment. This is not a thing of like, oh, I want to be so humble. Come on, you know your place. Come on, fathers. Come on, you know your place. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. Just close your eyes for a moment, fathers. Just close your eyes and, and make a vow in your heart. Because what good is it if we don't start? If we're not willing to select, I want you to make a vow in your heart that you're going to pick out somebody in your surroundings. 
Pick out somebody in your church. You're going to pray and you say, God, who? Who do you want me? And God say, about time. I'm going to connect you with this man. And you're going to speak into his life. You're going to bring change into his life. And that's you. And you're saying, you know what? I, I want to be used in my church. You don't have to be a pastor. You don't have to be a leader. You don't, not, nothing like that. You're a spiritual father. And you've got more than 150 sermons in your spirit. You're ready. You're connected. You're, you're consecrated. You want to help somebody. You're going to make a vow, I will, Lord, be used by you to select that person, and I will take a chunk out of my life to pour into this individual. Because I want the kingdom of God to go on. I don't want it to be extinct. Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for these men that have been touched other men. But Lord, I don't just see these men, these fathers, I see more sons. I see those sons becoming young men and becoming fathers. Father, so I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Father. Lord, use them. Use them, Lord God. Give them the joy of doing this, Lord. Use them in a mighty way. Lead them by the Holy Spirit. I thank you, Father. And Lord, those that just want to live a comfortable life, agitate them. Agitate them. God, stir us up. Lord, that we don't get selfish. Lord, that we do not take this grace of God in vain. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.